Good morning and welcome to worship with Webster Groves Christian Church and Memorial Boulevard Christian Church. I'm Pastor Jeff Moore and we're very glad you're with us. We hope that you'll sing along with the hymns, pray along with the prayers, and that you'll have communion elements ready so that you can join us for the Lord's Supper. I'm Mason Steele. I'm Orlando Garcia. And I'm Max Steele. We are a part of Memorial Boulevard Christian Church. Welcome to worship. Good morning. I'm Eric Bloffus. And I'm Beth Cooley from Webster Groves Christian Church. Welcome to worship. Please pray with me. Steadfast, faithful God, sometimes it seems that all have gone astray. While people claim to believe in you, their actions would say otherwise. As we gather this day to worship you, we pause to look into our own hearts and ask ourselves, do we truly believe and accept you? Open our hearts and minds and instill in us your Holy Spirit. Give us the wisdom to seek you always, so that in each and every act, every word and every thought, your love guides us. Let us show the world who you are to us by caring for others and spreading your love to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good pleasure. 
Good morning. This morning for worship, we read from Psalm 14. Psalms are like songs that people sang to help them understand who they are and who God is. When we know who God is, it's easier for us to understand who we are. And in Psalm 14, the psalmist, the singer of the song, the writer of the song, reminds us that God is sovereign. God is in charge of all the world. And that if we don't know that, then we're missing something very important. The psalmist also reminds us that we're all connected. And when something bad happens to some of us, that it also connects to what the others of us do and think, how we act. We are all connected as one world. God's in charge of the world that God has created. So I thought I'd show you something. This is a globe. It's a big map of the world. And this one was made in Haiti. And it reminds us that we are all connected. You can see lots of different countries of the world here. In fact, here's the United States. Here we are in St. Louis. And in fact, here's Haiti, where this was made. And in our prayers today, you'll hear the names of some countries. The United States will be mentioned, also Cuba and Haiti. We also mentioned South Africa in our prayers today and Germany, which is up here. But Every day that we pray, we should be praying for the entire earth, the whole earth that God made and that God loves so much. Because whether you live on this side of the world or all the way over here on this side of the world, we are all created and loved by God. And the way that we treat one another has a lot to do with who we say God is. If we really believe that God has created and loved everyone, then we'll want to make sure that everyone has enough to eat, that everyone is respected, that everyone can have the care of a doctor when they're sick, that everyone has a safe place to live. That's one of the best ways that we can worship God, is to care for the world that God made and that God loves so very much. So today, as we think about what it means to love and serve God, let's think about what it means to love and serve the people that God has made, the world that God cares for. Let's pray. God, thank you for making the world and making us. 
Help us to love one another. Help us to love everyone in the world and to find ways to work so that everyone has enough. As we pray for the people in Haiti, in Cuba, in Germany, in South Africa, and the United States, we also pray for the whole world. Some of us saw people from all over the world at the beginning of the Olympics. We saw their smiles, we saw their strength and their dignity, all of the different faces and different styles of clothing and different languages. We know, God, you create all of that. You love all of us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike, perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. Our psalm for today, Psalm 14, connects two things that sometimes we don't obviously connect. It connects the sovereignty of God, the question of who reigns in the universe, and economic issues, issues of oppression. In Psalm 14, we have an acknowledgement, a claim that God is sovereign over all the universe, and that some people don't get that. Some people misunderstand God's sovereignty, and they believe perhaps that they are the sovereign of their own lives or the universe itself. And then Psalm 14 goes on to let us know that there is a connection, a connection between what it means for there to be poor, not just people who are living in poverty, but people who are living in poverty because they are being oppressed, because other people devour them as if they were devouring bread. These two concepts, the concept of God's sovereignty and the concept of the poor and oppressed, live together in this psalm because they live together in the canon in the Bible, we often see that God's sovereignty is sovereignty that cares for all people, and when some people are devouring, eating up other people because of oppression, so that some people suffer while other people glory in all of the resources and all of whatever they can get, God cares about that, and God indeed delivers the poor. The psalm puts these two things together, one at the beginning, God's sovereignty, and then at the second part of the psalm, it seems as if what we're getting is, what are the implications of misunderstanding God's sovereignty? If God's really in charge, if you knew that, you wouldn't live a life, you wouldn't live in a society, you wouldn't be a people who could devour the poor, who could eat them up like bread. In fact, you wouldn't be someone who complicates or gets in the way of the plans of the poor. In our society, we often separate those ideas. We want our God talk to be God talk. It's inside church talk or it's personal piety talk. And when we have our God talk, we often don't include the political, the economic, the relational consequences of that talk. But the Psalms not having that. The psalm understands here that if God is sovereign, and the psalmist says, indeed, God is, if God is sovereign, then there is a problem 
with disrupting the plans of the poor. There is a problem with using and abusing and impoverishing other human beings because God's sovereignty is for all. We live in a world today where we separate those, as I mentioned earlier, but we also live in a world where as we separate them, we seem, like the people the psalmist is talking about, oblivious. It seems like we don't understand that there is a connection between what we say about God, about who God is, and how we treat one another on this planet. We've had some very interesting examples of how the poor are treated and what it means to disregard, to complicate, to make difficult the plans of the poor. In the news in this last week, we've had countries like South Africa and Cuba where the poor are rising up and where there's difficulty because they have not received the things that they need to receive. At the same time, we've seen on the news one of the richest people in the entire world shooting a rocket ship and himself into space. Somebody who has hundreds of billions of dollars at his disposal flying off into space while there are people who don't even have food to eat. Somewhere, somehow, we've lost the connection between God's sovereignty and the plans of the poor, between God as creator and lover of all the world, and how we are called to treat one another. What does it mean for us to live in a world where we proclaim God and God's sovereignty, and yet somehow we live in and seemingly accept systems where the plans of the poor are consistently dashed, prevented, Let's talk for a minute about the plans of the poor, because sometimes it seems as if our rhetoric around poverty is such that we imagine that there are poor people out there who are just devious. I remember in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan and his administration had this notion of the welfare queen. This was a poor person who was getting over on all of us. <clears throat> the idea is that there was this welfare queen that there were many of them, who had figured out ways to beat the system. And that's what they were doing every single day. While many of us were out there working hard, these people, these people who seemed to be living in poverty, were beating the system. With rhetoric like that, it's easy to see how we might think that the plans of the poor are devious. Poor people either aren't really poor, they're just trying to trick those of us who are not impoverished, or in some way, they're always deceivers. Now, don't get me wrong, rich and poor people deceive one another all the time. People are deceptive. The psalmist understands that. In fact, the psalm starts with the idea that all people do evil. But when we start using this class language, especially to denigrate those who are impoverished, to say something that is less than human about who they are and how they live, is really, I think, to implicate us and the systems in which we live. If we don't see and care for and guard the humanity of every single other person, we fundamentally misunderstood God's sovereignty. <clears throat> but let's talk about the plans of the poor some more. Let's say that the plans of the poor are not devious. It's not about world domination. People who are impoverished don't spend their days trying to figure out how to take everything away from everyone else. In fact, the psalmist lets us know that it tends to be the oppressors, the people who have resources, who are taking things away. In fact, they're eating the impoverished people as if they were bread. And that's the way it is. That is the way that it is in our nation and in the world. We know that there are plenty of resources in the world and in our nation. However, there aren't enough resources for some of us to hoard. When some of us hoard excessive resources, there won't be resources enough for others. 
maybe it's just me, but I think if you have enough resources to self-finance your own rocket ship and shoot yourself into space or subspace, something might be wrong, especially if you do it while your own workers don't make a living wage, don't have access to unionization or to breaks or to good health care. It might be true that there's something wrong if you live in a society where there are people who are going hungry. So it seems that maybe there's nothing wrong with wealth in and of itself. If you've got enough money to buy a rocket ship and shoot yourself into space like Jeff Bezos and others seem to think is so very important, and we live in a world where everyone has health care and shelter and food and respect and a voice, fire away. Build your ship. Shoot it into space if that's your thing. If you had a good idea and you've worked hard, and you've not oppressed other people while doing it, it would seem to me that that might be okay. However, if we're at a point, and I think we are, and the world has been for millennia, the psalmist realized this, where gaining wealth means oppressing others, where gaining wealth means exactly what the psalmist talks about, this confounding the plans of the poor, then we've got a problem. And why is this? The psalmist tells us, because God is their refuge. God is the refuge of the poor. We remember this God, the God who heard the cries of the poor who are being oppressed in Egypt and acted with a mighty hand that they might be saved. The poor, the oppressed, those who suffer are mentioned time and time again throughout the Bible. It's not an accident. It's because God's sovereignty is tied up with human integrity. God's sovereignty is connected to human thriving. And if some human beings are oppressing others, God's sovereignty is not being recognized, realized in the world. So what about these nations where there are difficulties right now, and I use difficulties euphemistically, where there is horror right now, where there is violence right now, where there is hunger, lack of access to health care, to respect, to safety? What about South Africa? I know South Africa fairly well. I earned my PhD in South Africa and lived and worked in and around South Africa for several years. And I know that it is an economy that is very divided. There are very, very rich people. Some of the richest of the rich in the world live in South Africa and very, very poor people. Some of the poorest of the poor in the world live in South Africa. The mathematical expression of this, the Gini coefficient is very high in South Africa. In fact, I believe it's the highest in the world. The distance between the poorest poor and the richest rich in South Africa is extremely high. But what about the United States? We have extremely poor people here and extremely rich. Some of the richest rich people in the world live in the United States. And while poverty in the United States has a different character in many ways than it does in some other places, our Gini coefficient, the mathematical expression of the distance between the wealthiest in a society and those who are most impoverished is also very high. What does that say about us? One of the things that it says about us is it's going to be difficult to have a society that works when we base who we are, what we do, and how we live on a system that allows some to profit off of the lives of others. When people are devouring the poor like bread, society can't work. It also means that our God talk ends up being empty just as the psalmist says. I love the way that the common English Bible talks about it. In fact, it's very, very blunt. 
Listen to this. This is verse four about people who don't understand God's sovereignty and seem to be able and willing to live in a world where inequality allows, in fact, requires that some suffer. This is verse four in the Common English Bible. Are they dumb, these evildoers, devouring my people like they're eating bread, but never calling on the Lord? out there busy oppressing others, getting what's yours, but never calling on the Lord, the Lord who does justice, the Lord who establishes righteousness, the Lord who demands that all people have what they need to live. If you're out there getting everything for yourself and causing others oppression, if you are supporting a system that does this, the Common English Bible translates the Hebrew to ask this question of you, of me, of us, are you dumb? Don't you get that God is sovereign? Back to the plans of the poor. I've spent time with people who are living in poverty. In fact, growing up in a, a single parent household, um, Week to week, it seemed as if we were struggling to make sure we didn't fall into poverty. And I saw my parent be a planner, and it wasn't world domination she was planning. What she was planning was how to have enough money to put gas in her car so that she could get to work. What she was planning was, how was she going to buy school clothes for three kids? What she was planning was how she could make sure that she bought enough groceries to last till the end of the week or the end of the month. Now, we grew up not completely impoverished. We grew up in a house where we always did have heat. We always had food. But I watched my mother plan and struggle sometimes to make that happen. And then over the years, I've had opportunities to live and work with and befriend and partner with people who are truly impoverished. And I've heard their plans, not plans of world domination. Plans like these. The plans of the poor are plans to feed their children, to secure their house, to do a good job, to have a good job, to receive health care, to receive and give respect. Those are the plans of the poor, not some made up welfare queen plans, but real plans. Plans that acknowledge that in fact, those terms that were used against the poor are terms that are really deep in our human experience and frankly, in our experience here in the United States of America. Welfare is a dirty word in the United States of America and yet I'm just positive that I learned the preamble to our constitution, that sentence or rather paragraph that says, why do we even have a constitution? And it says to promote the general welfare. The framers of the Constitution knew that the only reason that they were writing the Constitution was so that our welfare would be promoted, and not just mine and not just yours, but rather the general welfare. To provide a common defense, right, and for there to be general welfare. Everybody should do well. Everyone should fare well in the United States of America if we're to believe the preamble to the Constitution. And remember, the preamble isn't just something that's stuck on that doesn't mean anything. It's a lens through which we should understand how the nation was supposed to be set up. Now, that same document goes on in many flawed ways to say that some people count and some people don't, and some people count more than others. In many ways, that document is flawed, but it sets out to do something that's rather remarkable, something that we've not yet accomplished. The thing is, our biblical story is a story about the general welfare too. When God calls out to Abram in Genesis, 
God lets Abram and Sarai know that God will bless them so that they will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. That's in Genesis 12, 3. In essence, in that preamble text, the earliest text, the Genesis texts of our Bible, there's an acknowledgement of general welfare an acknowledgement that all the families of the earth deserve to be and indeed will be blessed by God because God is sovereign, not just over some, but over all. Let's go back to that awful term from Ronald Reagan in the Reagan administration, welfare queen. Well, we've talked about welfare. Welfare is a good thing. We should all fare well, and we should all work together to make sure that that happens. What about Queen? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could see one another with all of the glory, the justice, and the righteousness that allowed us to say, you are every bit as royal as I. You deserve to be treated like a queen or a king. You deserve that understanding under God's sovereignty. What would it mean if we saw each other as not only honorable, not only worthy of respect, but if we saw people who are honorable and worthy of respect and actually gave them the honor and respect that they deserve? So it turns out that the way we talk about God and the way that we treat one another, especially those who are most oppressed in our society are connected. They're necessarily connected. Psalm 14 understands that. Psalm 14 says, if you're going to see the world the way that we need to see the world, you're going to get that God is sovereign, and that has something to do, indeed everything to do, with how you see other human beings. If you're using them, abusing them, oppressing them, devouring them like so much bread, you've completely missed the point of God's sovereignty. If you are trying in any way to corrupt the plans of the poor, their plans for their general and personal welfare, you've missed the boat when it comes to understanding about God. Some of the plans of the poor survived some corruption this week in Missouri. You know that the voters in Missouri recently voted for Medicaid expansion. That was to be a part of the federal program that allows more people who are living in poverty, usually the working poor, to have access to medical care. You know that the state legislature and even the governor of the state were against this Medicaid expansion. They didn't want it to happen, and they had a number of reasons for this. Basically, they were confounding the plans of the poor. Again, not plans for world domination, just plans that when they suffered from diabetes that they could get treatment. When they broke a bone, they could have it fixed. When they wondered about their sickness, they could see a doctor. Frankly, Plans of the poor are the same plans that any of us would have. I plan to eat today. Do you? The plans of the poor are that if it's all possible to eat today, I plan that if today I need health care to be able to see a doctor. Do you? I plan to have shelter today. Do you? Those are the plans of the poor. Those are the plans of the majority of Missouri voters who thought it would be right to make sure that we take care of Missourians. The Missouri Supreme Court recently ruled seven to nothing unanimously that indeed Medicaid expansion could go forward. The plans of the poor just might be realized, especially and only if politicians and citizens in Missouri and other places understand, truly understand God's sovereignty as it connects to human well-being. When we acknowledge God as sovereign, we understand that we're connected to one another. 
then it matters if people have food. It matters if they have health care. It matters if they receive respect. That's what it means to truly understand that God is sovereign. And that's what Jesus came out to preach. The realm of God, the sovereignty of God. It's no wonder that when Jesus came out to preach these things, he talked about them vis-a-vis -vis what it means for people who are oppressed, who are living in poverty. In fact, the good news, Jesus says in Luke 4, is good news to the poor. Remember them, the, one, the ones who plan to have something to eat, the ones who plan to have health care to be healed, the ones who plan to have a safe place to live, the ones who plan for their children to be educated, the ones who plan to be respected. We should all join in the plans of the poor. We should acknowledge God's sovereignty, and we should work, work hard, so that we live in a system where those plans can be achieved, where everyone will have enough to eat, Everyone's children will be safe and educated. Everyone will have a place to live. Everyone will have access to healing. That's the way the sovereign God intends it. That's the way Jesus calls us to live it. That's the way that we can be the people of God. Amen. Our congregations continue in mission and ministry. If you'd like to become a follower of Jesus Christ or become a member of either Memorial Boulevard Christian Church or Webster Groves Christian Church, please contact us. We'd be delighted to talk with you and pray with you. In our worship service each week, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. This practice is uh, the central element of worship in our disciples' tradition, and it is open to all. In observing the Lord's Supper, we remember the Passover feast when Jesus shared bread and wine with his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. Today, in sharing the bread and wine, representative of Christ's body and blood, we affirm his presence here with us and we proclaim him to be the dominant power in our lives. The feast is now being made ready, and you are invited.
Wonderful God, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for the gift of friends and family. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for Jesus Christ who came and lived on earth and showed us a better way to live. We are grateful to be able to gather at this table knowing that we may not all be in the same room, but wherever we are, you are with us and your love surrounds us. As we take these emblems, the bread and the wine, whatever form they may be in, we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us as we take these emblems into our bodies, that we may be so filled with your love that we'll share it with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in a like manner, after the supper, he also took the cup. He blessed it, giving thanks to God, and he gave it to them, saying, take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you now to partake of the communion elements. Lord, in addition to psalms of lamentation, our Bible is full of psalms of thanksgiving. Here's just a few. Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Psalm 105, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And Psalm 107, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty 
and fills the hungry with good things. Again, our laments and complaints challenge us to reassert your message that this is your world created in love. And for that, let us give thanks. Good morning. I'm Diane Mark, and I'm happy to be speaking with you this morning about our congregation becoming open and affirming. Several years ago, our church board created the Graceful Engagement Team to explore the possibility of becoming an open and affirming congregation. And I was pleased to be included in that team. I conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with many members of our congregation. Everyone that I spoke with said that if a vote were to be held at that time, they would be in favor. But let me share a little personal background. I was raised in a mainline Methodist church in a small town in Northern Illinois. During the 1950s and 60s, gender identity never seemed to be at the forefront of anyone's concerns, at least publicly. I never had any reason to question the sexual orientation of any church members. But certainly, I witnessed teasing and bullying at school of anyone regarded as queer. I am ashamed to admit that I was a silently complicit bystander to such bullying. Fast forward to the present time. Several members of my extended family identify as LGBTQ. Throughout the years, I've known adults and youth in our church that may not have felt safe to publicly identify as members of the LGBTQ community. I don't think that they experienced any disapproval or rejection from anyone in our congregation. However, when I consider how few of my adult children's peers attend church at all, I can't help wondering if that is partly due to a misperception that Christianity in general disapproves of the LGBTQ community. So, in order to correct any such misperception, I think it is vital for our congregation to become officially open and affirming. In doing so, we proclaim that all children of God are not just loved and welcomed by us. All, all are entitled to dignity, respect, and complete participation in every aspect of our church life. Thank you. Memorial Boulevard Christian Church and Webster Groves Christian Church continue to advocate for the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are at work through prayer, proclamation, and presence, through learning and studying and praying together and teaching, and through sharing food and shelter. We need your help. We can't do this alone. We encourage you to continue to give to your local congregations, Memorial Boulevard Christian Church and Webster Groves Christian Church. Information about giving is on the screen. Thank you, Sovereign God, for this time to worship and praise your name, this time to be together one with another, to recall and recount stories from Scripture, and to talk and be together about what it means to be your disciples. We thank you for our congregations, for Webster Groves Christian Church and Memorial Boulevard Christian Church, for the neighborhoods we serve, and for the partnerships we share. We ask your blessing over us and our work, the work to which you call us, and we thank you for the grace we know through Jesus our Christ. 
We lift our prayers up to you, O God, knowing that you are a God who hears the cry of the people and knowing that you are a God who delivers the oppressed. We pray that we be those who honor your sovereignty by refusing to participate in systems of oppression and domination. We pray, O God, that you empower us to work for justice and to live as those people who understand and enact your righteousness. We know that we're powerless without you, O God, but that with the presence of your Spirit and the call through Jesus Christ, that we indeed can live as your people. We lift up to you now many among us who are ill or grieving or worried. We pray today for Martha Rule and Doran Rule and their family, the family of Mike Shaner, for Bill Sullivan and Arlene Sullivan, for Barb and David Farmer. We pray for Kenneth Tate. We pray for John Burney and James Burney, and for Winston Lloyd. We pray today, O oh God, for the family of Daisy Thomas, especially her sister, and for Devere Shoup, for Annalyn Howell's sister, Evelyn, for Devery Chris's sister, Rosemary, for Marilyn Stewart. We pray for Paris, and for Kim and Alonzo. We pray for Lola. Hear our prayers this day, O God, for people and nations where there is strife and oppression and conflict, for our own United States, for Haiti, for South Africa, Cuba, Germany. We pray, O God, for health care workers still fighting on the front lines against covid we pray for those making the decision about when and how to be vaccinated. We pray, O oh God, that everyone will avail themselves of this important health care. And we pray that you work to bring communities together and that we indeed will be able to overcome this crisis. We pray for all who are oppressed, all who are suffering, all who are being devoured as if they were bread. Remind us, O oh God, that all humanity is your creation. Remind us, O oh God, that the welfare of one and the welfare of all are connected. We pray these and all things in the name of Jesus our Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
and now people of God, called and commissioned and sent by Jesus our Christ, go forth from this place and this time into the world to share God's love in Jesus' name. Go forth in the name of our God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen.